Hey everybody, so MJ and I had a lot to say about this topic, so we decided to break our discussion down into smaller segments that kind of follow different subtopics. Um, so today is going to be part one of this discussion about terrible relationship choices in YA fiction. Um, today we're going to be talking mostly about the overall concept of um, the trend that we've seen in some YA books for unhealthy relationship dynamics and unhealthy relationship choices and why we think this is something that is worth discussing. So um, anyway, today is part one and uh, we'll be rolling out the next segments where we get deeper into the discussion in future weeks. Thank you. Welcome back to Trope Talks with MJ and Crystal. Today we are gonna be talking about Terrible relationship choices in books. Um, so that's our topic for today. You anything you want to start with? Uh, there's so many. There's just so many. <laughs> well, they were necessary because if you didn't write them, then the story would be boring. Like, I mean, realistically, you should not run off into the night with a guy who drinks blood for a living. I mean, yeah, that's or a bad choice. A werewolf. But, you know, <laughs> honestly, uh, just to use this as an example, the, the thing that bothers me the most about that relationship dynamic isn't even that he's a vampire. It's how creepy and, and unhealthy and codependent their relationship is, especially from the start. Like he literally stalks her and watches her through the window. And this is somehow normalized and romanticized. Into her bedroom. <laughs> and it's romanticized. It's romanticized as if it's like this super sweet thing. Um, to wake up and find a guy watching you sleep <laughs> right um so that's uh that's the trope we're discussing today um yes yes but it's a lot it really is and it's not just fantasy and a lot of times like um you know and and i think sometimes one of the one of the difficult things for adults who are writing young adult is that we have probably already been through a number of really crummy relationships ourselves or we've experienced and, and not just significant other relationships but just relationships with parents siblings friends you know we've, we've been through all these and hopefully come out on the other side okay um so i think sometimes we tend to trivialize those to the point where we don't really necessarily understand the magnitude for for someone who's younger to go through the same thing so like for example you know if you're in a relationship where your significant other is physically abusive, you know, as an adult, you know, that's not okay. Um, there are lots of adults who are still in physically abusive relationships. And I think that it might be a little bit harder for younger people to differentiate. Help me out here. To, to be able to identify physical abuse. It's, it's not just, you know, closed punches, you know, you know, fist hits and things like that. Sometimes it's just grasping your arm a little too hard to make you not do something he or she doesn't want you to do. Or the, the one that really drives me absolutely crazy that I think a lot of authors don't address well is emotional manipulation and yeah. how easy it is for someone to manipulate you using your emotions and you're not necessarily well experienced enough to be able to to pick up yeah. on that and emotional it's abuse I think by the author to make it clear yeah I think emotional abuse is so much harder um, for anyone to identify even adults um, yeah but especially for teens who are still like not as experienced in relationships so they don't have a lot to compare to um I you know, I'll openly say that my first serious dating relationship was emotionally abusive and it was not obvious to me because I was, you know, I was a teen and I didn't have anything to compare it to. Um, looking back, it's like, wow, there were so many red flags. Um, and even my friends so the at whole the time. Thing was a red flag. Yeah. And even my friends at the time who were also teens saw it and were like, like, they all stopped hanging out with me because they, I wouldn't let go of the relationship and they were tired of being around me when I was acting that way um because it it didn't just it wasn't just that the emotional manipulation was harming me it was also that it changed how I acted toward everybody else because 
um, I was afraid of my boyfriend getting jealous of me spending time with anybody else. So I cut off all my friends and like, as a teen, you know, that's a really damaging experience. Um, I look back at that phase of my life and think like how much I lost that I can't, I could never get back friendships. I lost uh, experiences I missed out on because I was so cut off from everything. Um, but it's hard for a teen to see that when they're in it and they can be very adept. Um, I know from experience, very adept at shielding anyone else from seeing what's really happening. So my friends all just thought I was being a jerk. Um, my parents thought I, everything was fine because I was very adept at playing everything off as my choice. I chose that, mm-hmm. like, no, like I'm fine. Like I wanted that. I wanted to not have any friends anymore, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Um, no, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So the, I think you know the portrayal of relationships in YA is so important because it's so easy for those normalizations to slip in where um, like I not again, not to rail on Twilight. Um, but I look, I look at the creepy stalker guy and I think, I mean, I can see, <laughs> um, and, and to be frank, when I read Twilight, I was team Edward. I liked Edward. I was rooting for Edward, but um, there's a level of creepiness that is just sort of glossed over to his obsession with her um, the fact that he knowingly puts her at risk from himself, um, again and again and again. And so, yeah, yeah. So, and and yes, he also protects her from other things. And in his mind, he's following her around because he's protecting her. Um, but there's a level of creepiness that's not fully addressed and it's not just Twilight. This is a theme, um, that is in many book, YA book series, um, Honestly, I think teen girls, and this is probably too much of a blanket statement. It's, I'm sure it's not 100% true. But I think the reason that this trope exists and why it works is because teen girls want a guy to be completely obsessed with them. Um, yeah. They want a guy to not be able to breathe for a second away from their yeah. presence. Um, and so I understand why the trope exists, but it's it's at risk of setting up an unhealthy dynamic if you don't balance it yeah. with something. So, yeah, I was gonna say kind of the same thing, but you know, there's a fine, very, very fine line between I do this because I love you and I do this because I have no self control or no, or like this obsessive thing. Like, I think if I were coming from Edward's point of view, because it's just the it, it, I really did like reading the books. It was a it was a great phenomenon, and she did everything right um, to become a popular series. And I think it's it's why it's so easy to use it as an example because it is a popular series and everybody mm-hmm. knows it. But as having been a teenage girl, yeah, that's exactly it. Like you want this guy who can't breathe without you, who can't live without you, who can't wouldn't consider doing anything that was not for you when in reality I think most teen boys don't really like like I don't know very many teenage boys who are going to prioritize a girl that much and I think that's one thing that as a YA author is something that we really really have to focus on is making sure that we don't set girls up for failure because boys don't think that way they just don't and that's okay it's realistic they're they're 16 17 18 years old they're not meant to find their forever love in high school and to set girls up to think that boys should be this certain way, I think almost sets them up for failure, getting put into an obsessive, abusive relationship with someone who's not in love with them and does these things because they love them, but because they're jealous people and they're possessive people. And that's not, I'm not sure if this, is, if this makes sense the way I'm saying it, but I don't want my daughter to read a book and think that Edward is how love is supposed to look. It's not yeah. supposed to be suffocating and dangerous and uh, all-consuming like that. I mean, I think her mother even says at some point in the book that it's that this is a really intense relationship. Um, yeah. And 
I think when you're a teenager, everything feels intense, but it shouldn't feel dangerous. I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't want her to get in, my child to get into a relationship like that. Yeah, I want you to be in a relationship with a boy who cares about you and would prioritize you over trivial things, but not someone who takes you away from your friends or ditches his friends for you and is possessive over you. Like there's a big difference between love and possessiveness and jealousy. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, in Twilight, it does go both ways. Bella is yeah. obsessive as well. Um, yes, she- but, and that is something that is something that, um, like, her father and Jacob are kind of like, this doesn't seem healthy for you. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting yeah. because oh. as the Depression. series goes on, that is the that is the right choice still. Like the obsessive relationship is the one she ends up in, um, which is interesting. So I know we talked a lot about Twilight specifically in today's video. Um, I promise it's not going to be the only example we ever use. It's just one that we've both read. That's a very popular one. And so it makes for a good starting point for discussions like this. It's definitely not the only YA book um, to have these sort of themes in it or to use these kind of tropes. It, we still believe that these are topics worth discussing and thinking about as readers, as parents, um, and as authors. So anyway, next week we'll have part two up where we go deeper into this topic um, using different examples and kind of exploring other aspects of relational dynamics in YA fiction. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you in the next video.